Thanks so much. Um, this panel is on America's role in the world. It is not, as it says in your programs, about US-China relations, though I'm sure we'll get to that in this discussion as well. I um, just want to very briefly introduce the panel. Uh, Aaron Friedberg is a professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton and co-director of the Woodrow Wilson School Center for International Security Studies. Uh, Steven Sostanovich is the George F. Kennan Senior Fellow for Russian and Eurasian Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and Professor of International Diplomacy at uh, Columbia School of International and Public Affairs. And Jonathan Alter is an award-winning author, reporter, radio host, and TV producer. He was a columnist and senior editor for Newsweek, is uh, now a columnist for The Daily Beast and an analyst at NBC News. Um, I guess uh, just to start off, um, the current president, uh, when he was running, promised a very different way of thinking about America's role in the world, one that saw a reduction in US commitments abroad, um, a sort of more narrowly transactional view of uh, US alliances. Uh, is, does the reality uh, match the what we were promised in the rhetoric? Has there actually been a major shift in America's role uh, in the you know, seven months we've seen so far? Or aside from Twitter, is the uh, uh, actual reality on the ground really just sort of a continuation of the status quo? Um, I guess, Aaron, we can start with you. Well, is there a reality other than Twitter? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think there are... There are two ways to answer it. One, uh, and it's the sort of reassuring answer that I find among my sort of foreign policy expert friends, uh, and that is that despite what Mr. Trump said when he was a candidate for president about alliances, about trade, about democracy, uh, he, in fact, at least thus far, hasn't really deviated dramatically from his predecessors. Uh, he hasn't pulled the United States out of NATO. He hasn't. Uh, imposed a 45% tariff on Chinese goods. He hasn't signed a treaty with Russia, whatever. Uh, and I do think that's true, but it's a little bit like uh, the initial tremor. The question is, will there be an aftershock? Uh, and there, I think uh, the jury is out. Uh, we don't know about the follow through, what he's going to do, and I assume we're gonna get into talking about some of these different domains, and there are possibilities for real change even in the next several years. We don't know about the reactions that have been set into motion now by at least these verbal uh, gestures that he's made. Uh, and last, we don't really know yet what the impact of the kind of rhetoric that he's used and the arguments that he's made is going to be on the American people. So it's the jury is out. Hmm. Steve, do you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I would say, I mean, I, I don't disagree with anything that Aaron has said. Um, I would say the most characteristic feature of the Trump administration's foreign policy has been a kind of frantic desire to uh, make good in some way on campaign promises, but without really knowing how to do it. Um, and, and I think that's the real, if there's a single message to other governments as to what to expect, it's, um, you know, did he say all trade agreements are terrible? Yes, in fact, there's a kind of you know pulling out of TPP, uh, renegotiating NAFTA, threatening to end the Korean free trade agreement, confusion about what to do with the European trade agreement, but in any case, not liking any of them and saying we're going to do better and we're, we're going to do beautifully and we're going to change it all and throw up for you know um, the prospect of not having any of these. Other kinds of tearing up involve the same sort of um, semi-delivery on campaign promises. Was the Iran deal the worst deal ever? Yes. So raising questions about whether or not to be in it but not, you know, climate change agreement, the worst deal ever. I mean, there are an awful lot of deals that qualify in Trump uh, rhetoric as the worst deal ever. Uh, climate, you know, out, but, well, maybe. But what are we doing instead? Who knows? Um, remember the other campaign promises. Bomb the shit out of ISIS. 
Uh, you know, for sure, the U.S. approach has been to loosen the rules of engagement, uh, a lot more bombing, uh, but now we're about to have defeated ISIS. And what's the, you know, is there some other strategy there? Uh, get along beautifully with Russia, you know, and attempt to do that, but without any real strategy to be able to deliver. So I'd say the real question raised by Trump policy is, you know, after we get over this initial hump of trying to deliver on campaign promises but not really being able to, what is there going to be then? And the answer is, we don't know. Mm -hmm. We have only a kind of rough indication that he thinks everybody else was screwing up uh, and intends to tear up uh, commit policies and commitments made. But what's the strategy for getting there? Is there one? Yeah. That's my, that's my summary of where we are. <laughs> John? So we, uh, I don't disagree with any of that. Um, we've just heard we don't know. And it reminds me of... Rumsfeld during the Iraq War, you know, he said there are the known knowns or the unknown n unknowns, and then there are the known unknowns. And I think we v very much have a major known unknown, which is that there will be a crisis. And we're living on borrowed time right now. We've been very lucky that there hasn't been, but there will be. You can't really get through four years uh, without one. And I think they're very, very poorly prepared for a crisis, notwithstanding that General Mattis uh, uh, seems uh, competent, competent in his job. Uh, Chief of Staff is competent in his job. Secretary of State is not, and this is a problem. Uh, Tillerson has never worked anywhere except ExxonMobil his entire life. He's shown very little interest in getting up to speed on, on the job. And the evidence of their problems is that make America great? No, make America weak. We are significantly, I think, significantly weaker in the world now than we were um, uh, when he took office. And the reason is that um, our military might has always been just a portion of our national strength. And we've had a um, if not a moral leadership in the world, we've had a values leadership uh, and a competence leadership that we have squandered. And um, I think we're at considerable risk of uh, an unnecessary military conflict. I think of Trump as, I think the historical figure that he most resembles is Kaiser Wilhelm. <laughs> we know what happened there. And there's much evidence in human history of war starting with stupid taunts and insecure, belligerent uh, uh, leaders who um, blunder their way into war. And we're already in brinksmanship with uh, another loser in North Korea. And uh, I, I'm not saying, I'm not placing the odds on you know any kind of a conflict, I think. People inside the government, including Trump, understand that uh, that a war would have no winners. But people have understood that a lot just before the commencement of hostilities. So there, there is a lot of possibility of really bad things happening. And I think some bad things have already happened. Uh, the uh, withdrawal from TPP uh, is not in the, the interest of the United States. And it just gives China <coughs> huge advantages in that part of the world. We basically have withdrawn from a leadership. Uh, it's true that um, he hasn't uh, you know, chucked NATO, uh, but he also hasn't done anything to strengthen NATO or show any particular leadership in the alliance because all of his contemporaries know what is a plain fact, which is that he is, and this is what the dictionary definition, he is the dictionary definition of an ignoramus. So they know that in their one-on-ones with him, he doesn't have a clue as to what he's actually talking about on the substance of any of the many issues that come to his attention. That is patently obvious from everything we know about this president. 
and that has consequences uh, because when you when you're just relying on your gut and your reality show instincts, you're going to make mistakes in your policy making and some very very complex policy choices that present are, are presented to any president. If you I want can, me to yeah, sure. be slightly encouraging, because we've been kind of downbeat here. <laughs> um, actually, crisis management, John, is what I'm less worried about than really? some other things oh, because the, the president may remind you of Kaiser Wilhelm, but actually the generals don't remind right. me of the that's German general staff at all. Good point. They're not uh, creatures of bureaucracy. They're not acting on a crazy strategic plan. Uh, they're not deeply insecure about America's role in the world. Um, and I think they're probably, I mean, if you want crisis management, John Kelly, Jim Mattis, and H.R. McMaster are probably a gold standard uh, for it. And Rex Tillerson is probably, you know, he's a sort of semi-level-headed guy as far as we can tell. But here, here's the problem. But, but no, no, let me just say, yeah. let me say one thing. You can manage crises okay and still have a disastrous foreign policy. And you can manage crises okay and have no strategy. You can manage crises okay and after four years, the United States can be just as you say, much weaker. So I'm a little more comfortable on the, are we going to blunder into war front? And, and, and just as gloomy as everybody else on the, the direction of the administration. Can I just Aaron, quickly you? respond no. to that? <laughs> so the reason I, I think you make an excellent point about the German general staff, but but I would argue that the Kaiser listened to them more than Trump necessarily listens to his guys. So when he was tw it came out in two or three different news accounts that these ridiculously reckless t tweets about North Korea were done over the objections of McMaster and Mattis. And you know this is not a reality show, and and so it, it, these tweets have real consequences. And so if 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 I thought that Trump actually listened to them on a consistent basis, I would be more comfortable. Yeah, I think this <clears throat> gets to another set of issues that maybe we'll talk about, which is the unusual degree to which this administration has thus far failed to staff itself, the, the numbers mm. of positions that are as, at the moment unfilled. There are people at the very top, uh, but then you go down a layer or two layers and there are acting this and acting that. Uh, and I think that actually creates another kind of problem. There's the crisis management problem, which we've heard sort of both sides of that. But I think the, the deeper, longer term problem, when you don't have a sufficiently staffed administration is that you can't do anything that resembles strategic planning. And it's not like tremendous amounts of fantastic strategic planning can go on uh, under normal circumstances, but it's absolutely impossible when you don't have uh, the various bureaucracies staffed and ready to participate in some kind of discussion of what the longer term goals of the, uh, of the country are over the next several years. And we're already sort of past the point at which a normal administration would have engaged in that kind of effort in the, in the first six to eight months. That typically would have been the period when you would re-examine policies in different domains. So that window is already closing, and we're already into the day-to-day -day business and pre-crisis or crisis managing in various different domains. So the opportunity actually to do that kind of reflection about where we want to go in our relations with China or where we want to go in our relations with Russia has been lost. Can, can I just amplify that point for a second with something that uh, I'm sure many of you know from, from history. Uh, first of all, there's a distinction between you know, Tillerson wanting to reduce the size of the State Department, which you could make an, a, an argument that, that that's fine, thoughtful. You know, the, there is a lot of duplication there, and you could do some reorganization in the State Department, and of course everybody's going to complain about it, but he, he might be right about that. The distinction between that and not filling these senior posts and driving people out of the government. And the latter, is, as you say, is really dangerous. So in the McCarthy era, one of the main consequences of McCarthyism was that the China experts were driven out of the State Department. So when it came time to make assessments of, of what are China's intentions 
Uh, we didn't even get the Sino-Soviet split in 1960. We had no experts in the department who could say, you know what, the communists aren't all on the same page here, you know, and this really, this thing in Vietnam, it's really more of a, as we've seen, for those of you who are watching the, the Ken Burns documentary, it's really more of a civil war, it's more about nationalism, and you're really not really uh, uh, assessing this in the right way. Well, why McNamara in his memoirs, 25 years later, conceded that, why did that happen? Why did we screw up so badly in our strategic assessment of the war in Vietnam? And it was partly, it was partly hubris and all kinds of other political factors, but it was partly this, this hollowing out of, of, our, of our smart uh, analysts who, who left the government because essentially Joe McCarthy and others drove them out. So how much of this issue, the lack of assistant secretaries and undersecretaries and ambassadors that we've seen in these various crises, I mean, how much of that do you attribute to just this administration coming in unprepared and being, you know, flat-footed? Or, and how much seems to be a sort of deliberate strategy to, um, you know, shift the way the U.S. interacts with the world? I thought you were going to say reduce the size of the federal government. <laughs> well, and that too. But. Um, well, uh, there's also a, a p particular factor in this case, which I should mention, but I should pref preface it by saying I don't want to appear to be engaging in any special pleading. But uh, there were a number of Republican Party foreign policy experts or people who had served in previous administrations who, during the course of the presidential campaign, said unflattering things about mm -hmm. the, the now president, including signing letters saying that they thought he was not fit to hold office. I happen to have been one of them. Uh, and all of those people are blacklisted. <clears throat> so 150 some people who may be of varying quality, but would normally have filled in a lot of these positions at the number two, number three, number four level are not being invited to participate. Uh, and that just means it's, it's not that that's the full universe of talented people, but it's, it's not an infinite set of people who mm -hmm. have experience and have spent time thinking about these issues. So they're in kind of a funny position in part for that reason. Uh, then there seems also to be, there have been a number of cases uh, in some areas that I'm aware of in part because there are people that I know who are hanging in the balance and have been told that maybe they'll be invited to take part and maybe not. And, in one case, at least, uh, our, I think your colleague at the Council on Foreign Relations, Elliot Abrams, uh, who was invited in for his meeting with the president and subsequently told that he wasn't going to be given a job. Uh, he thinks it's because he was confused with another Elliot, Elliot Cohen, who had been uh, publicly critical <laughs> of, of Trump. Uh, but people who, for whatever reason, are, have not been confirmed. We don't have a, an ambassador to South Korea. Right. A uh, friend and colleague of mine, Victor Cha, Georgetown, his name has been mentioned several times, but for whatever reason, the administration just hasn't moved forward. So here we are in the midst of this crisis, and the ambassador in that situation would like No assistant secretary role. for Asia, too. Nobody who's the, the choice of the administration. What you have is people who are holdovers from the previous administration, usually professionals, uh, but typically those people don't have a lot of leverage uh, with the new political appointees who don't know them may not trust them. So there's something, there are some unusual things about this administration. <clears throat> what I think Aaron is describing is part of the broader crisis within the Republican Party uh, between the, the clash between its establishment uh, and the uh, various Trump populist forces uh, which don't represent a, a single cadre of, don't have behind them a single cadre of experts. Typically, it, when you've got uh, at the end of, uh, you know, two administrations by one party and then the other party comes in, you've got the whole group in waiting. Uh, you know, sometimes it, they, it's gone too far. They've already measured the you know, the drapes and so forth. But the, um, this is an administration that is much more resistant to that kind of establishment uh, deference. Uh, and that's how you've gotten uh, all of the generals. 
you know, you've gotten the generals and the businessmen as the, in the senior positions. And I just a moment ago praised the generals, uh, and I stand by that. But I don't think that you typically look to the generals and business for reconceptualization or strategic direction uh, in your foreign policy. You tend instead to look to the people who've been kind of out of office for four or eight years, who've been thinking up, you know, what it is they disagree with that's been done and have developed a kind of uh, theory of the case. Aaron is a perfect example of that, and so he doesn't have to say the, you know, do the special pleading. But, uh, and I would, you know, disagree with a lot of the probably with a lot of the consensus critiques, agree with a lot of others. But you didn't have that kind of um, embrace of a, uh, of a kind of conventional wisdom of the party. And there's, as yet, no kind of alternative counter-establishment. So there's, sort of, right. there's no Trump foreign policy establishment. Maybe in three years there will be, um, but yes people who endorse or develop the basic ideas that he's introduced. I've, as, as a kind of mischievous suggestion, offered the view that this is going to be the golden age of the Foreign Service uh, because, you know, this is an opportunity that you'd have to go back 40, 50 years to find where actually all the bureaus of the State Department are being run by uh, foreign service officers. Mm -hmm. But I think it shows you something of how our system has evolved. For reason, Aaron got to some of the reasons why those people can't actually make things happen. They do depend on the incoming political appointees to legitimize their views. Right. Uh, they have to kind of connect with those people, interact, share ideas, and then have a foreign policy. By themselves, they have very little credibility uh, in our system. And it's made worse, of course, by the fact that they're, as Aaron says, acting. But that isn't the whole of it. They, they don't have the kind of political credibility that they need in order to push forward ideas. So everything is on hold. Yeah, so in this, I mean, I spoke recently to a foreign service officer that I know and she, I made the same argument you did. You guys are running things now, you know, nobody's home. <laughs> and she said that at first it seemed like that and that somebody that she greatly respects, a very senior foreign service officer, at first told her, don't leave. You know, we have to hold down the ship. <clears throat> and more recently told her, maybe you should go. You know, this, this is not tenable. It's not working. We, need, we have to have some kind of direction. And we're being pushed around by, um, you know, the, there, there's this group of White House uh, munchkins who have been put in with Tillerson. And one of them, uh, I, I can't say I've met, but I saw him uh, in New Jersey at the trial, the Bridgegate trial. Do you remember that? And he was the first witness in that case is his job in the Christie administration had been to put together a kind of an enemies list, keep tabs, and you know it was the mayor of Fort Lee, New Jersey, who wasn't on Christie's side, so that's why they shut down the traffic on the George Washington Bridge. Anyway, this guy is now the white, his name is Maurer, he's now the White House's guy in the State Department. And he and a couple of his buddies are kind of right now running American foreign policy. And it's a little alarming. No, it's a kind of foreign policy. But <laughs> um, so, so from the point of view of U.S. allies in uh, Europe and Asia, I mean, uh, to what extent do you think they really are sort of reassessing these uh, long-term relationships based on what they're seeing for this administration, or is it the U.S. relationship is just too important, and you know, all these things will pass eventually? There are differences uh, between Europe and, and Asia, and I follow Asia more closely than Europe. But I think in both cases, uh, people are of necessity having to uh, ask the question, what if the world tomorrow is not like what it's been in the past? It's one of the things, by the way, about Trump's election. Whatever else happens, this possibility that the American people will elect someone who seems 
totally at odds with uh, predecessors and what our foreign counterparts have been used to dealing with has now been introduced. And it's a little hard to go back to the notion that, well, we have, we have variations of uh, plain vanilla. You know, we have Democrats and Republicans, but the differences in foreign policy are really not, that, not so great. Now people aren't so sure. Um, I think in Asia, uh, our principal allies there are you know, hoping for the best and beginning to think about the worst. Uh, in the case of Japan, holding very tightly uh, to the relationship with the United States because of their concerns about China and Korea. They don't really have a good option. And to a certain extent, Prime Minister Abe seems to have developed a good kind of chemistry with, with President Trump, and so they're not, they're not as anxious as some others. Uh, but in general, there is, uh, I think, a deeper question about uh, the staying power uh, uh, of the United States. But nobody, nobody wants to jump. No one wants to say uh, in Japan or South Korea, for example, We've just decided that we can no longer rely on the American extended deterrent guarantee, so we're going to launch off and develop nuclear weapons. They're starting to think more about that possibility in the longer term. They probably were beginning to think about it for other reasons, uh, but they're not going to do it. So I don't see dramatic shifts in the near term, but I think there's a kind of recalibration and anxious, more anxious than usual uh, effort to figure out what in the world is going on in the United States. You always see that. Uh, when there's a new administration, uh, you start getting phone calls from people in various places who are trying to figure out who's up and who's down. But it's continued now for a year, and people just are not are not sure. And in some cases, because these various positions are not filled, they they don't know who to call, they don't know who to ta talk to, they're not sure. Mm -hmm. it, it's a little bit, uh, just to, to look at the glass half full for a minute, um, uh, they're very sophisticated in their analysis of... Uh, domestic politics in the United States. Um, and I think they understand that a lot of this bluster doesn't necessarily reflect where things are going. They're not taking the tweets at face value. Um, some of what seems to be happening, and, and Trump does this domestically too, is the same way if, if uh, a military unit is retreating, they will cover their retreat with a volley of fire, you know, so it looks less like a retreat. Um, Trump does some of that. So, you know, he, it doesn't look like he's going to pull out of the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, they just, uh, you know, recertified the lifting of sanctions. It really, it doesn't look like he's going to bomb North Korea in the short term. But by sort of tweeting this way, he is saying to his base, I'm still the tough guy. You thought I was. I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do some of the things I said I was going to do, but I, I still look tough. And I think uh, internationally, there's a recognition of that, that, that he's playing domestic politics uh, with some of this, and uh, it makes them a little less anxious. Hmm. I'd just add one other thing to this. The, um, there have been a lot of, over many decades, crises within all of the American alliances, uh, and no allied government is experiencing a concern about American policy for the first time. Um, but right. uh, there are some particular anxieties here um, that lead to consequences that can be pretty unsettling for the way we think about, uh, you know, it isn't just the Japanese who are thinking about nuclear weapons, the Europeans are. You know, there's, there is some kind of halting progress toward thinking about an EU nuclear force. Well, I, I got to tell you what that means. It means German nuclear weapons. And the Russians are going to think, that, you know, they're going to think, actually, this isn't really what we, what we wanted. So there, there's a lot of that kind of concern about where does this go. And I'd add one last thing to it. It would be one thing if it looked as though you had a, an American president who had very strong domestic position and could deliver things when necessary and had a kind of strategic direction. But I think as time goes on, the question for a lot of uh, allies may be, um, it isn't just that we can't deal with Trump, it's that, you know, that we don't know where he's going, but that we don't but we actually don't think he 
stands for very much. Mm -hmm. And if the president's political weakness is deepened, that in itself is a problem for, uh, for American alliances. And people begin to make adjustments. The king of Saudi Arabia is going to Moscow. I just, you know, that was supposed to be the example of the uh, alliance that was fortified and given new life by Trump. You're just making other arrangements. I mean, that's we're becoming increasingly irrelevant. So you could say, and if you're if you're not American, you could go, well, what's wrong with that? But if you are American and you know you're, you're used to us showing leadership in the world, people will uh, just do uh, what they call in business, you know, workarounds, and and uh, just develop new bilateral relationships all over the place. I think we're already seeing this, and not just nuclear, even. Conventional. Look at what's going on with the uh, uh, the Japanese military and going on in the Diet. You know they are now moving fairly quickly. Whatever Abe's relationship is with Trump, toward uh, much more um, uh, much more robust defense. Now some of that is because of North Korea, but but I think some of it is they're just less sure of that. Umbrella, like they're not, sh they're not confident. If, if uh, I don't think any of the countries in Asia are confident of what, uh, uh, how the United States would respond if there was an incident in the South China Sea, would they make things worse? You know, these various hot spots that could erupt at any moment. There's no anticipation that there would be intelligent, well uh, reasoned. Um, policy making, because you can have the greatest staff people in the world, you can have the smartest national security advisor in the world. It, it is ultimately true that it all starts at the top, and it's very, very hard for them to argue against his gut. He's gone with his gut for his whole life, and it got him to the White House, and he will continue to use his gut to respond to global events. And I think this was one of the problems that President uh, George W. Bush had as well, not his father, who I thought was an excellent foreign policy president, but George W. Bush was a gut player. And the problem with being a gut player is you, you can be right a lot of the time if you've got a good gut, but your batting average over time can't sustain itself. So with the passage of years, if you're using your gut, it's like guessing at pitches. You know, you're, you're going to eventually your batting average is going to go down. Some of this, I mean, there are a number of things one could say. Some of these developments are not necessarily negative from the perspective of the United States. The further development of Japanese military power, in my view, is not a negative thing in and of itself, uh, first. Secondly, some of these developments are also a continuation of trends that have been evident for a while, and including a concern about the reliability and direction of American policy that extend back before the current administration, and then include doubts and uncertainties and concerns about the Obama administration. That's certainly true in Asia, and I think in 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 Europe as well. So it's not it's not all new. This may be accelerating things that were that were present before. Uh, the last thing I'd say is uh, I do get the sense that uh, when you talk to uh, foreign colleagues and uh, travel overseas, uh, there is a kind of deeper uncertainty, just as there is here, about the dynamics of American domestic politics and where this is all going. And I've been doing this for a while and had, used to have a little spiel about how, well, you know, it, it looks like we're deadlocked and that's sort of the way our system is meant to work and it's always highly partisan, this is nothing new, and to reassure people, and basically I would say I believe that that was true. It's a little harder now to say that to people because the system is operating in ways that I think most of us have not seen before. Now it may revert to the norm, uh, but it may not, and no one knows for sure. So when people ask about um, the divisions over economic issues, for example, or the extent to which the American people might become more supportive of protectionism, uh, it's not as easy as it once might have been to be dismissive of, of those possibilities, or isolationism in some form. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's what's going to happen in the long run, but there's more uncertainty. If I could just pick up on the point you made about the Obama administration. I mean, if, if there's a central rhetorical theme for this president, it's undoing a lot of what his predecessor did. But as we've mentioned before, the Iran deal 
It hasn't pulled out yet. We'll see what happens next month. Um, Paris also, maybe not a full um, withdrawal. The, you know, the, yes, the rules of engagement have changed, but maybe there hasn't been a major policy shift in Syria or Afghanistan, really. I mean, it, you, you know, uh, seven months in, are, are you surprised by um, the sort of continuity between this administration and the last one? Or is there, um, or has there, uh, really been a decisive break? And if so, I mean, what's your sense now of the state of Obama's international legacy? Well, uh, Steve made a point earlier that I just wanted to highlight. It's not, again, unique to this administration, but it may be carried to an extreme like so many other things mm -hmm. by this administration. And that is the tendency of whatever new group comes in to be in favor of the opposite of whatever its predecessors were in favor of and against whatever they were for. Uh, so a lot of what the current administration is saying, at least, is, I think, in the minds of the people saying it, uh, a response to what they perceive to be the weakness and uh, the inabilities of, of the previous administration. As I said earlier, I think for now, the changes are not so dramatic. Mm -hmm. We don't know yet whether in the long run they're going to be. Uh, I mean, there's, a, I guess, a larger question about the legacy of the Obama administration. And, and, of course, people are so caught up now in arguing about where we're going that they're not spending a whole lot of time looking back. That'll come. And I don't think it's going to be particularly favorable. Much <laughs> my view. You can add to that? I, I think if I could plug my own work a little bit here, you know, we do tend toward these uh, cycles between activism and retrenchment. And at the end of the Obama administration, we we're kind of at the phase in a retrenchment cycle where you would expect a kind of robust debate about whether we should continue on that course or uh, return to a more activist policy. And, uh, you know, it was interesting that in both parties, you actually had a, voices in f probably the majority in favor of something like a continued activism, or, a, or ra I'm sorry, a, a, a renewed activism, uh, a need for more American direction uh, and initiative in responding to international uh, challenges. We haven't had that debate. Uh, we've had only a kind of chaotic, and, and often the debate doesn't really take place in the election campaign. <clears throat> it takes place between the two establishments. And I would say both the party establishments are in a kind of crisis, but especially the Republican one, mm -hmm. uh, because it is that establishment that should have produced the answer, whether it was a complete repudiation of the past policy or not. Um, I find an awful lot of, uh, but one of the things, uh, and let me just add one last thing and then I'll let John answer. Um, I, I think there's surprising unity among, uh, within the establishment of both parties now because there's such a, it, there's such a focus on wh what, how they disagree with Trump. That's, probably necessary and salutary, but it's at a cost. Mm -hmm. Because we're really not talking as much as we should about what the strategic direction of the, of the country ought to be. We're just saying, this isn't it. Well, I think if we look at the Obama administration and try to, um, you know, I, I made an effort. I wrote two books about Obama when he was in office, trying to do contemporary history. And it's very tricky. Uh, you need to let things settle before you can really come to judgments. But I do think that we know, uh, I, I, I believe eventually we'll find that it was not Syria, but um, Iran that was the most important focus of Obama's foreign policy. Um, and a lot of what he did in his first term was getting China and Russia to agree not to veto sanctions in the Security Council. And um, Thank God he got that deal through, and the people in Israeli intelligence, while all their entire political establishment had to be against it, they all were. Of course, we want to buy, buy time with Iran. Of course, we're, they told me, of course, we're for this. 
Uh, and so the fate of that deal is, I think, essential to the security of the world. The good news is I get the sense that Trump is headed for doing what a lot of people, rightly, at the time the deal was signed, believed, which is, yes, go ahead with this deal, but on another track, be much tougher on Iranian support for Hezbollah and their other mischief-making in the world. And I think that's where they're going. That seems to be what Trump is hinting at. I, I really hope it is, uh, so that we can be kind of on two tracks with that policy. Now, to my mind, the, the worst thing that happened in the Obama administration is rarely remarked upon, although it's, you're hearing it more nowadays, and that is uh, the invasion of Libya. Uh, the bombing of Libya, the removal of Gaddafi, because the message that that sent, n not just to Kim Jong-un, but to any dictator anywhere in the world, is race for nuclear weapons. That's the only security, that's the only insurance that you have. I'm concerned about Europe developing a uh, nuclear weapon, but I'm much more concerned about despotic regimes developing nuclear weapons. I think they have much more incentive <coughs> to do so, and I don't see any real impediment on them now, since Trump doesn't seem to care about nuclear proliferation on, on uh, a number of different uh, leaders uh, moving in the next five years to nuclear weapons. I think uh, we have some time for audience questions. Um, let's go with the cadet here in the front. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm Jack Krause, a sophomore at the United States Military Academy. Regarding America's uh, role in the world, Many people see America as a world police, and maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing. My question to uh, the panel is, what would be possible consequences of the United States withdrawing troops from various bases, from Guam to Qatar, Germany and Spain? What would you see as possible consequences of reducing our military presence uh, in areas like that? Uh, look, I think the, uh, the actual uh, f operational significance of that is not as great as the strategic message uh, that it sends. Uh, we can do without this or that uh, forward presence, uh, and often that forward presence is pretty small. Um, you know, uh, people don't comment enough on how much we've drawn down uh, our uh, troop footprint in, for example, Europe, which is, you know, 20% of what it used to be. Um, but it hasn't led to a real concern about whether or not there's a, a, a continuing NATO commitment uh, to, uh, you know, co the common defense. Uh, if you had that kind of drawdown uh, that seemed to carry a, a broader message, uh, that would have a lot of significance. Uh, and that, I think, is what's kind of very unclear in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the Trump posture. Uh, it seemed to be awfully hard on his... He's had three trips to Europe this year. Uh, his endorsement of Article 5 was seen universally as very grudging, uh, very belated. It's something that his staff had to get out of him. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean it had no significance. Um, and, but I think a lot of European leaders, what European diplomats say to me is, you know, yeah, we really came away from that thinking, who is this person and what is... Uh, you know, what's the, what's the real uh, commitment? And I think that's a deeper issue than just ha what the presence is. Although, uh, I would, I'd say, actually, uh, even in Europe, to fortify the commitment, uh, the United States has actually been building up its forces, building up its capabilities. Uh, by the way, Josh, I, I would say that may turn out to be one of, the, because, ironically, because it's an area of relatively little interest to Obama it may turn out to be one of his more significant legacies. I'd say, uh, actually, in the past 
the last two years of the administration, you had a, three years, you had a significant revitalization of NATO. I think Macron, the Macron relationship with Trump is very important, and Trump, at least for now, seems to uh, like Macron. And so the idea of nationalism, retrenchment, the kind of Steve Bannon type approach to foreign policy seems to be a little bit waning. And, and since I don't think Donald Trump has really deep beliefs about very much uh, on anything, uh, except his own, you know, press. Um, uh, I, it, it may be that we look back and we go, you know what? There was a lot of talk about us moving into uh, a, in a really nationalist direction, which was something I was very worried about last year during the <coughs> campaign. But it didn't really, it didn't really end up happening. In the meantime, there's a lot of pressure to increase defense spending, and I don't think they would increase uh, defense spending and and you know, uh, pull back our forward presence at the same time. I think in, in Asia, it's particularly important, it's necessary, I think, for the United States to have a significant forward presence in order to maintain uh, the, the capabilities that we have there. We're concerned about freedom of navigation. We have to be present and active along with our allies and strategic partners. And also in that part of the world, I think we're engaged in a pretty vigorous uh, strategic competition with another great power, China. Uh, and to pull back at this point would be to cede that area, I think, to uh, effectively to the, in the long run to China's domination, which I think would not be in our interests, let alone the interests of our friends and allies. So I don't see that happening, uh, fortunately, but I think it would be a dangerous thing if it did. Questions? Is that a lady in the front here? Yeah, yeah. Karen Chapman, what China strategy should the United States have right now? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> how much? That's how yours. Much, how much time <laughs> do we have? Uh, that's it's a huge and important question, and I can't possibly answer it in the time that's available. I think uh, we need to be working a lot harder to maintain a favorable balance of power in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, because China's power is growing and China's growing stronger. I think we also have to re-examine some aspects of the engagement portions of our policy, particularly economic, uh, the economic engagement, uh, which in some ways is, is uh, not working to our benefit or not as much as it should be. Um, so uh, I think we have to compete more effectively with China because I think China is competing very vigorously with us. Yes. That's the 30-second version. <laughs> yeah, can I just oh. add to that? I think we need uh, a new TPP, the Trump-Pacific Partnership. He can call it. He can name it after himself. <laughs> but we, we need to just, we need to go back to the table. And uh, 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 the trade situation is moving very unfavorably against the United States. And we need to try to get at least some of what we accomplished in that deal back again, or we're, uh, we're going to let China write the rules of, of uh, trade. Sir, you had your hand up, friends. So I'm Sarwar Kashmiri from the Foreign Policy Association. And I realize this is going to be very hard, but if you could just put yourself in Mr. Trump's position for a few minutes. Uh, and uh, I'm thinking back to four presidents ago. We had a North Korea uh, that didn't have nuclear weapons. We had a North Korea that didn't have the means to deliver them. Uh, they now have nuclear weapons. They now have a hydrogen bomb. They have the means to deliver them. So I guess if you were coming into the, into the office, wouldn't you at some point say, gee, all of these best and brightest, all of these think tanks, all of these wonderful analysts, uh, why do I want them? Here we've got 30,000 American troops in, in, uh, uh, in South Korea, we've got uh, troops in Japan. Why would I want to, or why would you want to hire all these people who've done nothing but let North Korea uh, develop the means uh, to have a nuclear capability and deliver it? So I just wonder if you could handle that for me. Is that for me? For anyone who wants to take it. Well, I'm not sure about the framing of the, of the question, but 
uh, I think if you, and I'm, you mentioned going back for, you're going back. For, well, you could say, yeah. All right, yeah, the, the great, okay, all the great right, got it. yeah. Uh, well, look at what the administration is doing. They are cycling rapidly through all of the not very good options that the previous administrations have cycled through and coming, I think, uh, to, the, to the recognition that there is no magic bullet and there is no good solution to this problem. Having said that, I think that there were opportunities to perhaps to slow or stop the North Korean nuclear program, which were missed. I would say uh, I'm aware of those that occurred or were uh, the opportunities that were missed in the administration that I served in, which was the first uh, term of the Bush administration, uh, and which the uh, current administration is now, I think, trying to, to utilize, and in particular, the use of financial sanctions. Uh, the Bush administration was reluctant to continue to apply financial pressure to North Korea in the early 2000s, in part because of concerns over antagonizing China, uh, and chose to back away from what I think might have been a very effective tool for choking off the ability of the North Korean regime to get access to the resources that it needed, not only to continue to fund its special weapons programs, which involve imports and inputs from various places, but also on the part of the leadership of that regime to maintain uh, the, the uh, favorable uh, disposition of the people in, in the structures of power in North Korea. They need hard currency in order to do that. So there was an opportunity, I think, to really press very hard on what we, I think, discovered was a vital lifeline uh, of the North Korean regime, but we chose for a variety of reasons not to do that and hoped that by going another path we might be able to enlist the help of the Chinese and apply effective pressure. It didn't work out. The people who are really responsible for the current crisis are the Chinese, not the foreign policy establishment of the United States. Uh. I understood your question in a slightly broader sense. That is, what good is the, you know, is Washington conventional wisdom, right? Or at least, or even more broadly, the, the conventional wisdom that comes out of think tanks and universities and op-ed pages. Um, and, and I think it's a perfectly legitimate question. Our conventional wisdom often is full of, uh, of defects. Um, and it's a president's job to highlight those defects and to get people uh, challenging each other and to get new ideas. Um, and if that's what were happening now, I'd be a lot more comfortable uh, with the situation. But I actually don't think it's what's happening. Um, you can't, a president rarely can come up with his own ideas. Uh, he needs to empower, but also to provoke and challenge uh, people around him to do better, to come up with uh, initiatives and new concepts and uh, to implement them. Uh, and th this is uh, actually turning into administration which that process uh, doesn't happen where there's a lot more uh, just who, who can please the boss uh, at any given moment and who can keep the boss from doing something uh, goofy. Uh, that's not going to get you a successful foreign policy. You've got to have, uh, you've got to reach deeper. You've got to challenge people more. And, uh, and uh, so that process of kind of not being satisfied with the conventional wisdom is a perfectly good one. I just don't see it producing the kind of results that we see, need now. You know, I, I completely agree with that. And you, you can see why President Trump is frustrated, um, and he's expressed it publicly, because there were many lost opportunities. I'm mean, just reading about one. There's this special fuel that is required for ICBMs, and we did nothing to control their ability to obtain it. They were getting it from abroad, and, and we could have prevented that. We never even really focused on the issue, uh, and, and that would have put us in much better shape. But the, the problem is the, the premise some t somewhere in his reptilian brain, Trump believes that if he pounds 
Kim rhetorically that that will increase the likelihood <coughs> of a coup. Okay, that's you've got to give him some credit for thinking it through, right? He, 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 I, I would imagine that what he is saying to himself is, I want to put so much pressure on this guy, even if I'm elevating him, that some of his buddies will stage a coup against him. Now, that if you're talking about sanctions and tougher sanctions, that's a reasonable supposition, that's a reasonable premise to use in trying to squeeze him, is that if you squeeze him economically, there can be a change of government, or at least you can have some hope that there might be a change of government. And the fact that we're now tightening the sanctions, I think, is they should have been tightened a long time ago. What we're doing right now should have been done a long time ago. Um, but rhetorically beating up on him usually, historically, has the opposite effect. It strengthens the regime that you're beating up on because it's a natural inclination in any society if an outsider, especially the United States, is attacking your leader in extremely personal terms. That strengthens the leader. <coughs> and what you need in a meeting is people who will raise this and explain this. And my guess is, since we now know that, that Mattis and McMaster are not behind this idea, that they have told the president this, and yet he has gone ahead and tweeted this, this uh, the, uh, you know, we'll wipe you off the face of the earth kind of tweets anyway, which is really alarming. I think we're about out of time now, or, uh, Adam, one more? Yeah, okay, I think we've got to wrap it up with the reptile brain. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much to all our panelists and uh, for all the great questions, and thank you for coming. Before we adjourn, uh, I'd like to thank our outstanding panelists. I'd like to thank you, our outstanding and engaged audience. I'd like to thank the outstanding FPA staff for putting this on. And let's give them a hand. And I have one announcement to make. There will be a post-mortem with our master teacher, Eliza McClellan, for the students who would like to uh, participate in it. So thank you again. And uh, Forum 2017 stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.